Welcome to another Fireside Chat. I'm talking today with uh, MVP Olaf Monin. Hey, Olaf, thanks for joining me. Hi, Jim. Thanks for inviting me to this uh, Fireside Chat. Absolutely. And you are our regional coordinator for, I cannot remember the term, but basically yeah. German region, <laughs> yeah, German-speaking German, countries. Yeah, German-speaking countries, which is Germany, obviously, and Austria and Switzerland. And of course, there are some, there's at least Liechtenstein, which is also considered to be in, in the, we call it the Dach region. It's a D-A-C-H. Yes. So we, in, in German, it's just called Dach, which means in English, r roof. So sometimes funny. <laughs> It was interesting when I was making the regions up, I was trying to find, you know, ways that were logical, but also that created similar sized groups. And there I would, I knew that we had a lot of MVPs in Germany, but I didn't realize how many MVPs we had in Germany until I was doing the counting. It was like, wow. So yeah, it's, Europe got really split up a lot because there's just a lot of uh, MVPs in that area. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we have many MVPs and there's quite some activity here. I mean, it, it's not like that we have all day like meetings with MVPs and stuff like that, but we have some of the um, well-known MVPs over here, like Stefan Klinke, or, which is uh, the author of Spring 4D. And we have, of course, Uwe Rabi, who is my, well, He's the vice president, or whatever you call it, or <laughs> the uh, regional coordinator. And he's the author of several interesting tools for the IDE, which is the, yeah. the project magician, which is really, really, and I think it cleans up your deproach file, which is uh, a big XML file. And mm -hmm. he also has the MMX Explorer, which is a great tool through, for navigating through your uh, code. Great thing. And there are, of course, several other MVPs over here. Yeah. So I can't uh, name them all. <laughs> yeah. The Project Magician, I, that was like one of those things that was like, this is, I almost felt like this was a bug in the way Delphi behaves and that the, the XML file changes the order of things, uh, which when you're checking it into source control is always a pain. And I was like, ah, this is annoying. And then I discovered Project Magician. I'm like, oh, well, there's the solution. Yeah. It just puts it all in the same order every time. So it's deterministic. And yeah. that makes it so much easier to work with. It also cleans up certain areas where are things that are not really logical. Mm -hmm. Like when you are in the project settings and, and you create these three levels where you have settings for a platform and then for release and debug. And, and sometimes you get into inconsistencies over there and, and over did a great job cleaning up there as well and platforms that are selected or not selected are also cleaned up so yeah it, it's definitely a tool that everybody should have especially because yeah. it's free so i had dahlia on the other day and had a conversation with her about memory managers as well and mm -hmm. she talked about like how you can do smart pointers and stuff like that if you want to mm -hmm. if you if you want to have arc for traditional objects it's not that hard one of the things that's good about 10.4 Unified Memory Manager is that if you had somebody that had desktop code and mobile code and tried to share it, then you had this inconsistency because you have two different memory managers. So it's good that it's now unified, but the problem is that if you were leveraging ARC on mobile, now you have to change that. Correct. Yeah, the, the, the problem is on the mobile side, you just didn't, or you didn't need to care about freeing up your uh, instances that you created because Arc would basically take care of that. But it turned out together with um, the ownership model and interfaces that we already had and, and records, it didn't really coexist in a very well working way. So that was the ultimately the reason why they took it up because there were conflicts that they couldn't uh, resolve. So if you have code in, in, or in, in mobile applications, then you have now to, to go through every single line of your code or at least there where you create instances of something and apply the traditional way of freeing up the instances. It's work, it's gonna be tedious for large projects, of course, but it's going to be worth it because it will probably take out some of the mysterious bugs that you have in your applications. Because somewhere at some point, one of the memory management system were fighting 
about instances and if to free or not to free and, and that produced, well, errors. So if you go through it, you will have to apply the traditional try finally pattern or other ways that are well known since decades in Delphi. So, and still, if you want to keep yourself a little bit out of manually freeing up stuff, you can still apply the interface model, which is perfectly working. And of course, interfaces or the automatic reference counting that interfaces have in Delphi doesn't apply to T-component because in T-component, it's turned off. That's yep. the reason why it coexists. Mm -hmm. And with RSC or ARC, um, that didn't coexist very well. And, and that's the reason why you still can use interfaces and it's a good thing. But if you don't like interfaces, no problem. Just create TFU, make it try finally, work with the TFU instance, and at the end, free and nil it. And that's it. So Yeah. I, I was a little hesitant about Arc at first because I didn't like change, I guess. <laughs> I think a lot of people are in that boat. But after a while, I got camera on to it. I was like, okay, I like this. I understand how it works now. But going to this unified memory manager model gives us consistency, but also gives us more control, I feel like, right? And that we can explicitly yeah. say, this is a regular object. It's mm -hmm. managed by ownership. This is a regular object. I'm managing myself. This is an interface or a smart right. pointer with a record. It's being managed this way. Sure. And so you can you can do exactly what you want to do and not yeah. have to worry about what second guessing you behind the scenes. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's one part of the story. And I mean, if you look back in history, ARC is not bad. It actually originates not, I mean, it, it's not completely true, but it was promoted by Apple. When right. they came up with the iPhone and the iOS, at the very beginning, in, in the first two years, they had a Xcode and Objective-C language where you had literally to do manual reference counting. So you had to decrease and increase the reference to the instances that you created. And I if you thought about that, yeah, I, I did a full Objective C stuff. I, I have, yeah. I have, I had a massive iOS application running which was written in Objective C. So it was good for me to to understand how everything works on the iOS side and and took that knowledge to to Delphi eventually. So, and over there you had to do everything manually. And if you had one decrease to less or one increase to many or whatever, so if if decrease and increasing references on, on your instances, then your application would just crash. There is not even something like in Delphi where you have, oh, there's an access violation in, in your code or something. No, it, it's just a black screen and that's it. So that was the time in, in iOS when even well-known applications just crashed, just so. Um, and at one point in time, that got improved. So you rarely saw crashes out of the blue in iOS. And that was the point in time when they invented ARC or when they um, introduced it in, in uh, Objective-C. Right. So, and that did all the magic that we had in Delphi, but they didn't have, or they still don't have a ownership system or interfaces that somehow interfere with everything that ARC does. So they only have ARC, and that's the reason why it works perfectly in, yeah. in the Apple world, in the iOS world. And, but in Delphi, like we already said, you have interfaces that in, interfere with ARC. You have records. Well, if you want, there are also arrays. And of course, you have T component with its ownership model, and that all interferes with uh, each other and, and ARC was like a alien to it. And, and mm -hmm. that's probably the reason why it never got completely stable. And if it got completely stable or if they the engineers made it work in a completely stable way, then of course it would be a great option to put that back into the VCL. And then we had unified memory management as well, but that didn't work out. And that's yeah. now where we are. I know I was talking to Marco about that, and he said that they looked at it and said, you know, having the two memory models was a lot of complexity and realized mm -hmm. that taking all of the VCL 
and converting <laughs> it to ARC would be a huge undertaking, whereas it would be a lot less work to go the other direction. So that's why they yeah. decided to go that way. Uh, one of the yeah, things, yeah. though, that you, you know, with Delphi, you could, you know, use interfaces or whatever. You have a lot more flexibility. And technically, I mean, th- there was a, a garbage collected memory manager for Delphi mm-hmm. years ago because you mm-hmm. can plug in your own memory manager. So technically, someone could make an ARC memory manager for Delphi and swap it in there. But of course, the, the issue is all comes down to uh, mm-hmm. all the libraries being compatible with it and working yeah. appropriately. So. And yeah. and it it's uh, gonna run in, into the same issues that Arc had with the T component stuff. I mean, they are fighting about when to free an object and when not to, and 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 that's. I mean, why are there uh, different ways of freeing an object like uh, destroy and dispose? What's the difference between those? It, it there is a difference because it it's not clear when. Arc calls free, and when the ownership model calls free, and that's the reason why we have these weird, well, different calls. So it's clearly, well, the unified model that we now have with 10.4 is probably the cleaner, better, and well, better understandable way. You know what happens and when it happens. Yeah. What one, one of the things I've always liked about Delphi is I feel like it's got a really good commitment to backwards compatibility. Sometimes, like uh, Unicode or this, there are some changes that do mean, mm-hmm. you know, making some changes to your code. Are you, are there, do you know if there's any of the uh, static code analysis tools like uh, uh, Code Healer or... I do quite do... some uh, stuff with Pascal Analyzer. It, it's, yeah. it's an interesting tool. It gives you quite some, I would call it, or I always call it, an overview of the uh, code if you go as a consultant into a new project. So it tells you a mm-hmm. lot about the project and what's good and what's wrong with the project. So it, it tells you where to look first. So it's not something like um, run Pascal analyzer and after that you, you basically come up with a fixed up a project. It's right. not like that. You, you need to know what the messages that it spits out are really telling you and which messages are important. And and of course, if you have a a project that produces near to no messages, it's probably a better project than one that produces hundreds, if not thousands of messages. And of course, Pascal Analyzer has like, uh, I don't know, a hundred different options. You need to know where or which ones are those to switch on. Like, in any other tool. So it, it's definitely a tool that is worth looking into if you have a huge project, even if it's not a historically grown project, it could even be used for a modern project that you just created a year or two ago. Right. I mean, it, it, there are so many things going on that as a uh, developer, you, you can't know everything. That, that's the whole point of it. No, you can't, yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if one of those tools ha- would be useful in trying to address your code, make sure you've freed all your objects correctly. Or I guess if you're using the uh, full fast MM for, yeah. it can give you right. the, the messages as well if you're not freeing yeah. things. So there's uh, there mean, are a number of tools out there to help you with that migration for sure. Yeah, I mean... Uh, FastMM is a very helpful tool, and it's actually integrated in Delphi, but it's yeah. only the basic version. It does all the memory management things, so there is no improvement over that. Well, actually, if you um, put in the the lab, the latest versions of it, it actually speeds up your application by some microseconds, depending on what you're doing. So uh, right. that's something I found out. So they improved the code since uh, Embarcadero take the last snapshot, mm-hmm. at least in 10.2 and 3. And once you are looking into memory management itself, like are you having like memory leaks or are you overwriting memory, which is also an issue, not that bad in Delphi as in C languages. But anyway, you still can do that by over not checking pointers and pointer ar- arithmetics. But the first thing when you do a project, the first thing that you always do is you should turn on report memory leaks on shutdown in the DPR file. 
tr mm -hmm. always turn that to on. I usually don't do it just on true because that would fire up a, an ugly dialogue on, on your customer side. Mm -hmm. If you don't want that, I only uh, want that in, in debug mode. So you can technically put uh, if devs around that, but as we all know, if devs don't really work that well in DPR files, what I do is I set it to the report memory leaks on shutdown equals debug hook is not equal to zero. So yeah. if the debug hook is only larger than zero if the debugger is attached. So right. that's a, an easy way to tell, okay, only run that while in, in the Delta debugger. So that's what mm -hmm. I do. And then that gives you the first clue of, okay, I have a uh, memory leak here or there. But to really figure out what it is, and if your code is complicated and you have like a zillion si lines of code, then you would, uh, would want the uh, full or the uh, source version of FastMM, which is available on, on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And if you take that and put it into full debug mode, you can actually have several things that go on at runtime. The first thing with the memory uh, leaks is it will create a log file where you see the whole call stack at the point where the memory leak was detected. So it's a huge file if you have many memory leaks, but it's worth going through it to figure out what's happening. And it has uh, some protection. So it creates um, certain protection around the memory that you allocate. So mm -hmm. if you are in full debug mode, the application will run slower. That's for sure. But it, right. it, it creates those um, protections around uh, your allocated memory. So once you override that, it will detect that. And you get, of course, a error or a warning that you're overwriting your own memory. And that's very helpful when you are dealing a lot with pointer or metrics or so. So yeah. definitely a tool that you should use. One other thing we want to talk about, though, is the C data. Now, have you done a lot of work with the C data components, yeah. enterprise connectors? Yeah, of course. When the C data thing came out, uh, we all tried some simple stuff. I started, I, I think I started with WhatsApp for business, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. C data has a connector for, not for um, WhatsApp, but they have a connector for Twilio. Twilio is a multi-channel communication platform, and they mm -hmm. integrate with WhatsApp for Business, and CData has a connector for that. So with that, it was relatively easy to create a simple application where you could send messages to your customers on WhatsApp for Business. And all done through uh, FireDuck uh, queries. So you, you basically just set up a SQL uh, statement where you pull or where you select from a table which has messages in it. So you, you get the messages that are there for you to read. And then you put up a insert statement into a table and that's a message that gets sent out to, mess to WhatsApp clients. So really amazing. I mean, yeah. it's SQL adapted to work with APIs, it, it's, it's usually REST APIs, which are in between us, the developer, and, mm -hmm. and the back end, yeah. and it just worked. And then, I mean, we have seen a couple of these um, demos where people did these, well, initial experiments. And now I, I'm currently working on a project, an internal project, where we are collecting items so there's a warehouse and that warehouse has items it's mm -hmm. due to corona it's now the job to bring these items online so previously it was just a stationary business so they sold stuff in events taking place around football games and, and stuff like this in trade shows so there's somebody going with a ipad through the warehouse and taking pictures. And these pictures and some description of the item is going into a Google Sheet, something that you like uh, uh, pretty much. So you are sending yeah. everything out in Google Sheets. Yes. <laughs> so you, you can actually create a Google form, which is based on a, a Google Sheet, and then even take pictures. These pictures, the images, the image files go to Google Drive. 
So you have Google Sheets and Google Drive, where I have descriptions of items and their photos. And then there is an online shop system, which is Shopify. Shopify is one of the, of the uh, large or big players doing online business. So mm -hmm. they have, of course, an API. So the challenge was now to get the information from the Google Sheet and the Google Drive into Shopify. Of course, I could have used a T REST client and figure out how to do all these things, right. including the authentication, which is, I mean, it's nothing complicated. Well, it, it's complicated. It's There's steps well involved. known. <laughs> there are steps involved. That's, that's a good uh, description. There are steps involved. So uh, authentication is in industry standard, but every industry does it different. So. Yes, they do. <laughs> so you have to authenticate with Google Sheets. You have to authenticate with Google Drive, and you have to authenticate with Shopify. Mm -hmm. The good thing is CData has drivers for all these three systems. So I have yeah. three FireDuck connections, three of them. Mm -hmm. One goes to Google Sheets, the other to Google Drive, and the other one to um, Google uh, to Shopify. Yep. And they have an automatic authentication mechanism built in. So you just check a box and say, okay, I want automatic authentication. And it just pops up a uh, form, a web form that you just need to fill out. So yep. there is nothing that you really have to set up, which is great. So I'm creating a connection to... Google Sheets, read all the records in that spreadsheet, put that into a regular uh, query and dis display it with a uh, TDB grid. Yep. So I see the data from that sheet, which is easy. It's basically no coding involved. It's just setting up the connection and the yep. uh, query. And then in there's a specific line or uh, actually a field in, in that spreadsheet that has a simple piece of JSON in it. And in that JSON, there is there are links to Google Drive, yep. which are the images. So there is some coding involved because I have to take that JSON and put that into a tJSON object, which is easy, and pull out, well, the, UR, the URL for the images. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then... I have my second connection to Google Drive, which also has an automatic authentication, so I don't have to worry about that either. I just need to put in my Google uh, credentials for that. And again, I create a query and feed in the URL to, for that image. And it returns, well, some steps involved, it returns the blob of that image. So yep. I can just save it as a JPEG file. Mm -hmm. So I can go through the spreadsheet line by line, download the uh, image. I just use a Tnet uh, HTTP, HTTP client for that and do a right. get. It's mm -hmm. easy. And then, well, actually, no, that's stupid. It's not why. It's, it's just the data. It's a query. It, it just returns the blob. My first idea oh, yeah. was to yep. have... Yeah, my first idea was actually, oh, yeah, I need the, the, the Tnet HTTP, but that doesn't work because Google hides the files behind some authentication and some system that you, which is really complicated if you wanted to do that natively with HTTP. So that's where CData comes in and makes it easy just with a uh, query or a start procedure. So I have the item details and I have images and then I have my third connection that goes to Shopify. Again, just put in your credentials and figure out they have excellent documentation. They tell you exactly what table you need, what query you have to execute mm -hmm. to put up products and their quantity and their images. So I can just insert into a query again my details from what I took from Google Sheets and post it and okay the image is a second it, it, it's a second step because there is a store procedure to upload an image so you have a store procedure and that store procedure um, takes an image as 
an image file, actually. It, it's just a file that you give the store procedure and it just loads off that file, the blob data, and you're done. It's, it's just amazing. I mean, it's, if you know how uh, FireDuck works and if you read through the documentation of C data, it's, it's a great thing. And they have over a hundred connectors and it seems they are all working. It, I mean, it's not yeah. just that they put up some crap there or so. It, it's <laughs> amazing where they take the time from because, I mean, I was involved with when Embarcadero started creating the bass providers for uh, PARS and for yeah, Kiwi. For kin- yep. and, f- and figuring out the API is what you have to do. It, it, it's a massive job. Yeah, it, it is. There are so many endpoints that you have to think of and to integrate with your uh, solution that that's, you, you can end, end up working like two weeks just understanding the API. And with CData, it's, it's crazy. I mean, there are connectors to SAP, for example. And, and I mean, for enterprises, it, it's probably an important thing. So yeah, I like it. It, it works in real projects. Yeah. Yeah, I the the I use the Twilio one as well. My dad has a band and wanted to do requests by text message, and he came over one afternoon and we sat down. and I used the Twilio connector, set up an account on Twilio, and it's like it's really cheap. I want to say it's like he pays like five dollars every three months or something like that for how many text messages mm-hmm. he does, and because he uses a tablet for his music, so made uh, a Windows tablet, made a little program. Little thing pops up. Hey, here's the next request. He can tap on them, hit reply, all right there. Hey, you know, cue up the songs that he wants to do. And it was literally an afternoon sitting down at the kitchen mm-hmm. table, and yeah. I wrote it with him. You know, and it it's just that easy. And yeah, the I, Fire Deck is really powerful, and the fact that you can just extend it to reach data, like yeah. you said, anywhere, yeah. is great. Yeah, is it's is really great. And and you can yeah. actually focus on on the real thing, like. I put in some image manipulating uh, system there because some images are not landscape, but upside mm-hmm. down, things like that. So I just load it into team bitmap and rotate it. And I, I have fields for correcting the description where typos are. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, that's where the, the actual work is of that application. So you don't have to put so much time in understanding an API, which is not just three endpoints or so, there there is a massive load of yeah, endpoints yeah. in these systems. You know, it, I've noticed in the broader program or developer community, people seem really excited about Python. And I, one of the things that I discovered people like about Python is that there's all these libraries and stuff for it. Mm-hmm. And that oftentimes you're just integrating things together. I'm like, well, that's what we've been mm-hmm. doing with Delphi forever. <laughs> uh, most, yeah. most of the code <laughs> I write in Delphi is just integrating you know, I'll just use FireDAC here and I'll use a grid component there and I'm done, you know, and you, yeah. you can write a little code or you can write, you know, less code. But then when you need to, you can write as much code as you want to and access all the APIs, which is another beautiful thing about Delphi. So, yeah, yeah it's great. I mean, it, it, that's probably one of the reasons why I'm a Delphi user, because there are many things that are really easy to to do. Sometimes you are, of course, tempted to look into C Sharp. I mean, C Sharp is a language that I understand. I I did some uh, projects in it, so I'm more or less familiar with C Sharp. So if there is something I can't figure out in Delphi, I go to C Sharp and do it there. But I had something with Dropbox, a small project, and I couldn't find a drive for Delphi that, or something that has the API for um, Dropbox translated to Delphi. So I decided, okay, it, it's just a small thing and just a few lines of code. I just need the API and I need to, to create some URLs and stuff like that. So I went to C-sharp to figure out how, how they do that. And it looked great, but in the end, I believe they messed up the threading model. It, it's, it's not that I don't understand it, but they shoot themselves into the knee. and It was good to see how they do that because I missed the point that actually C data had a Dropbox driver as well. I I just missed that point. For what reason, I never looked at C data for a Dropbox driver, but they have one. So it would probably 
have taken uh, half of the time to do that in Delphi because yeah. you just, well, probably just create a query and, and get what I wanted there. Yeah. I, I've a few, so I, I started out programming in Turbo Pascal and Delphi and then have since then gone and done Java, Objective-C, C-sharp, and a number of other languages and came back to Delphi because I love Delphi. But sometimes there's been times I'm working on a project and I it can't get, I'm like, ah, this isn't working. Must be something wrong with this Delphi mm -hmm. API or, mm -hmm. or something. And then I go like, okay, I'll just implement it in Java or C sharp or whatever. And most of the time when I do that, I discover the problem wasn't with Delphi. The problem was the API or the problem was <laughs> that feature on this OS or this yeah. interface is broken. It's not, and I was like, oh, it, it's just as bad in, in Java as it was in Delphi. So, yeah, it's interesting. For sure. Yeah, but sometimes it's it's good to look into other um, oh, development yeah. environments and, and their frameworks just to see how other people are doing stuff. It, it gives you quite some clues about things, and it, it's always a good thing to, well, broaden your um, knowledge and, and not to be too limited in in your skills yeah i'll talk to people some developers and sometimes they'll be like oh i actually do a little objective c or a little of this too and i'm like that's fine first reason they think that because i work for Barcadero that i'm like have blinders on and hate everything but delphi but i, I actually <laughs> encourage people and think it's a good idea you should have a lot of tools in your tool belt as a developer right, right. i mean delphi it is one tool but there's a lot of times you reason you want to use other tools too I, in my opinion, it's the best. <laughs> but you know, if, if you find that you have a project that really needs to be done in something else, go for it. You know, and yeah. figure out how to integrate it with your Delphi stuff. That's all. It's all good. So right. Yeah. Well, fan, yeah. Well, this was great. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Olaf. Is good talking yeah, to you. Yeah, sure. What was a fun talk. Yeah. And good catching up. And we. Lots of exciting stuff coming along with uh, 10.4 and everything. So we'll sure be seeing you more of you. <laughs> yeah, of course. All right. All right. Have a good day. Take and, care. Uh, it was a pleasure for me. Take care. Bye.